In 2002, many hardcore Spider fans were finally given something we've been desperately waiting on for several decades. A cinematic rendition of our favourite webhead. So naturally, there had to be a video game adaptation. Welcome to Does Whatever a Spider Can, in which we take a look back at the webhead's long and varied gaming career, and find out just how much they replicate Spider-Man's signature powers. Spider-Man was released on May the 3rd, 2002 the same day as the movie, to serve not only as a direct tie-in, but with a view of expanding the story in its own unique way. Let's just quickly get something out of the way, shall we? Due to the numerous other games called Spider-Man, including an incredibly popular version just two years prior, this game is commonly referred to as Spider-Man the Movie, or Spider-Man the Movie the Game, for those like me who wish to be pedantic. Spider-Man the Movie the Game was developed by Treyarch for the Nintendo GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox with Grey Matter Interactive adapting it for the PC. Treyarch previously had worked on the Dreamcast port of the 2000 Spider-Man title, which itself was developed by Neversoft. And despite some visual and gameplay similarities, this was created on a completely different engine. In fact, this was the game engine that Treyarch developed themselves and used to create their games during this console era. This included the next couple of Spider-Man games, but also the early Call of Duty games, Kelly Slater's Pro Surfer, NHL 2003, and the minority of board video games, strangely enough. With this in mind, it's not really surprising that there is very little difference between the versions of the game. However, there is a vastly superior graphical difference with the PC port, as it could render the game in a much higher resolution. If you do decide on playing the PC port, then I'd highly recommend against using the mouse and keyboard. You really need to get and program a controller to get the maximum playability. Spider-Man the Movie the Game is loosely based on the events of the film and follows most of the same plot structure. The game adds events and villains which expands the game, plus includes a roster of characters that come straight from Spidey's rogues gallery. These characters are Shocker, Vulture, and Scorpion. It's clear the reason they use these characters is that they figured they wouldn't be part of future film sequels. However, 15 years later, two of them would make their way onto the silver screen, and in the same movie, funnily enough. The Xbox, however, would also receive an exclusive extra mission revolving around Kraven the Hunter, and a chase through a zoo. It's unclear why this wasn't included in the other versions, and overall doesn't it appear to even affect the story in any way. The game features the voice talent of both Tobey Maguire and Willem Dafoe reprising their roles of Peter Parker slash Spider-Man and Norman Osborn slash Green Goblin, respectively. Let's find some new people to play with, shall we? I'd like to vote against that. Along for the ride is geek god Bruce Campbell, who revised the voice work of the tutorial announcer. Yahoo! Uh, hey, king of the world, don't let it go to your head, okay? Bruce also having worked in the film as the ring announcer, who gives Spidey his name? The terrifying, the deadly, the Amazing Spider-Man! My name's the Human Spider. I don't care, get out there. No, he got my name wrong. Get you out tell there, me. you moron. <laughs> and he also worked behind the scenes of the game as the senior floor lead, whatever that means. Shocker and Vulture, also played by Morden Solis and Lieutenant Reginald Barkley. Unfortunately, none of the other movie actors reprised their roles in this particular game. Instead, their roles were voiced by some really great talent in the voiceover industry. I recommend go checking out their IMDb. So you start off the game with a brief flashback explaining how Peter got his powers, the wrestling match, and Peter letting the robber go, before finally ending with Peter discovering that Uncle Ben had been killed. Donning your homemade wrestler suit, you swing from rooftop to rooftop, beating the crap out of the Skull gang members trying to find the one who killed your uncle. Can any New Yorkers please confirm that gangs hang out on skyscraper rooftops? I was sure they hung out in cars banging the bottles together. You chase him to a warehouse where you're subjected to a pretty bad stealth area, do some annoying puzzles before finally confronting the guy that killed your uncle. And then, shocking horror, it's the guy you didn't stop at the wrestling match. He then freaks out, takes a few too many steps backwards, and falls through a window, cleanly stopping any potholes about him returning. After the obligatory Uncle Ben responsibility cutscene, we finally get to play in spandex. And this is also where it starts to diverge from the movie a bit. Unlike the movie where it's implied that Spidey and Gobby were created on the same night, Norman Osborn and his lab technicians are trying to finalize their super soldier serum. Osborn needs a functioning version of the serum or else they lose their military funding and his company, Oscorp, along with it. They theorize that whatever changes that happen to Spider-Man to give him his abilities will likely get the serum working. 
So naturally they send out an army of killer robots to get him. After Spidey leaves a load of metal carnage around, not, not the other carnage, Spidey literally drops into a robbery in progress, headed up by the Shocker and Vulture. Vulture escapes and Spidey pursues Shocker and confronts him at Grand Central Station. Spidey saves the guards and bystanders before beating up some thugs in the obligatory sewer level. Spidey chases Shocker into the subway, avoiding Shocker's blast, then proceeds to beat him up before finally pressing for the info on where to find Vulture. Spidey goes to capture Vulture by climbing in the inside of the Vulture's lair. That is not at all littered with traps and bombs in a place made completely out of wood. If you manage to survive the blazing inferno, you confront Vulture at the top of the Chrysler building and proceed to beat the crap out of the old man. Good for you, Spidey, for not letting age be a factor in your violent retribution. Not long afterwards, it's revealed that Oscorp scientists are able to remotely track two arachnid profiles by their DNA signature. Wait, what? You've got the technology that can track DNA from a distance, and you're not selling this to the government. <sighs> Fine. Oh, so they somehow managed to get Spidey and the other arachnid profile in the same location, and then they start attacking them with their spider bots. I am honestly not sure at this point if they're going for irony or not, as even Vulture has them. It turns out that the other unlucky schlub is Scorpion, who just happens to be half arachnid in this version, and not just some dumbass stuck in a suit. I, I mean, he still is stuck in the suit, but you get what I mean. Anyway, they both beat up the robots before Scorpion goes full tinfoil and claiming that Spider-Man is clearly part of the same shady government agency that's trying to capture him. You're with them! I can tell. I, I can tell. Scorpion is woke AF. Spidey chases him into the remains of Grand Central Station, which still looks 9-11. When Scorpion attempts to finally murderize the Warcrawler, Spidey manages to defeat him, but not before Scorpion can get away to come back in a future game. We'll burn that bridge when we cross it. This is where it starts to return to the movie as Norman is kicked out of the company and proceeds to use the experimental serum on himself, creating the Green Goblin. Gobby proceeds to attack the I Can't Believe It's Not the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, where you rescue Mary Jane. Yes, she's in this. And then you proceed to chase and beat up Gobby. During this time, a teensy spider Spiderbot manages to snag a photo of MJ kissing Spidey that couldn't possibly lead to a plot revelation. Gobby has the upper hand, and with Batman levels of foresight, has scattered bombs around the city that you need to defuse before the time runs out. No mention of a super bomb, unfortunately. Gobby then proceeds to unleash literally dozens of Razor Bat drones, which leads to Spidey to run away. Hang on. Multi-billionaire Razor Bat drones. Are we sure this isn't Bruce Wayne? So finally, when the coast is clear, Spidey manages to snag a half-destroyed Bat drone. And then he takes it home to discover that, oh no, it's made by Oscorp, which is run by the father of his BFF, Harry Osborn. So naturally, Spidey must break into Oscorp and wreck some stuff, because he's totally not a vandal. Whilst trying to infiltrate the building, Spidey just happens to find that Oscorp is not only producing potentially lethal chemical weapons, it also has a giant bloody, not at all trademark infringing sentinel in the basement. This is when you find out that Gobby has abducted Mary Jane, assuming she is Spider-Man's girlfriend. He needs to get out of a fully locked down Oscorp facility, now placed on high alert and full of killer robots. Simple. And after annoying chase sequence, Gobby is about to pull a Gwen Stacy on her. No, I've done that joke. Fortunately, Spidey swings in and sets her down in the middle of the bridge. And jeez, couldn't you have landed closer to the cops? Either way, Spidey and Gobby duke it out until Scobby reveals he's Norman Osborn and proceeds to impale himself on his glider. Norman asks Spidey to tell Harry I'm sorry and proceeds to die. But thankfully, he was rich, so he had plenty of credits and just respawns. In a move that's radically different from the movie, Spider-Man and MJ hook up and have many tiny Spidey babies. Okay, I'll let Spidey explain. Yeah, that's my life. Complicated. Looks like you're done now. Go outside and play. On the whole, the game is still pretty good, despite being a movie tie-in. While it does have its issues, and we'll get to those in a tick. Graphics lines, I still think this game looks good for the era. I genuinely even like the look of the PC's higher resolution. Naturally, they are a little dated having been made 15 years ago, but it's a damn sight better than playing the Atari 2600 game for 10 minutes. Playability wise, I just don't think it's held up as well as the other Spider-Man games of this period. Although it's a damn sight better than most video game adaptations of popular franchises. 
After the nostalgia hit wore off, I just started to want to play something else, as after a while, I just stopped having fun. It honestly became a struggle to keep playing it even for the footage. This is mostly down to one problem with third person 3D adventures of the time, the camera. Whilst it's not nearly as bad as some other games of the era, it's still not as intuitive as it should be for moving a character such as Spidey. Crawling on the walls and ceilings can sometimes be an absolute pain. You often find yourself moving in a direction that seems counterintuitive to your position, which gets even worse when the camera moves in an awkward position. This also somehow gets even worse in chase scenes when turning sometimes is non-existent. Simply put, you have a limiting amount of steering when slinging, which can be a problem if you're trying to avoid tall objects like, I don't know, buildings? Naturally, this gets more noticeable when you're moving at full speed, which is of course an essential thing during something like, I don't know, a chase? Whilst this is manageable on a console like the GameCube, it proves nearly fatal on the PC without a controller. Even then, default layouts can be a pain to deal with. Beyond that, the two biggest gripes I have with this game are the stealth missions and the wall crawling detection, especially when swinging. As mentioned, there are a couple of stealth missions in this game, and whilst I enjoyed the Oscorp one in the past, it feels badly outdated now. The main problem with the first stealth section in the game is that you're supposed to go through a door, but it leads immediately to someone detecting you. Even if by some random bit of luck you don't get detected, you still need to fight the thugs in the room, which can also call the thugs in the previous room to come fight you, rendering the whole thing pointless. The biggest problem with the stealth in the Ops Corp mission, however, is that it can just get overly complicated when all you want to do is just move on. In one section, after you stealthily break in, you need to stealthily find five computers and then stealthily hack them for the password to the main laboratory. Stealthily. If you get caught and don't want to face a crap ton of robots, you must reload and end this way back to the beginning of the level. This is because there's no checkpoints unless there is a major cutscene. So restarting the level from the very beginning after a long progression is frustrating. Finally, the wall crawling, whilst fun and really character, just gets aggravating with the camera issues. Again, a staple of early 3D third person games. Another problematic issue is that you attach to a wall as soon as you touch it, which in theory is nice and simple. Unfortunately, you sometimes will accidentally move onto a wall in a small corridor, plus with the bad camera moves, this can get deadly in a battle. This is often worse in the indoor sections, leading to them being some of the worst parts of the game. Let's be brutally honest though, Spider-Man plays at his best when he's web swinging around and fighting crooks in the open. The indoor sections only got included after complaints of the lack of such things in the 2000 game. However, these were then later removed in the game sequel and movie tie-in Spider-Man 2, the movie of the game. Oh, damn it. One of the major annoyances in combat is that there is absolutely no invulnerability cooldown after taking damage. There are sections when you can literally take several hits and go from full health to almost nothing in seconds. It really doesn't help that the health and web pickups can get pretty stingy in this game too. Speaking of webbing, even though these are based on the movie with the seemingly unlimited organic web shooters, Spidey still has a limited amount of webbing he can use in combat situations. Thankfully this does not affect web slinging, but there are times when you need it to fend off enemies, and it just runs out way too quickly. This is possibly one of the holdouts from the previous Spidey games on the PlayStation, but a severe lack of web cartridges and the inability to stack them leads to some problems. So this is where I advocate for the cheat system. This game has an easily available cheat code system located in the specials menu. And besides infinite webbing, there doesn't really seem to be any OP cheats in this at all. Well, at least there's no invulnerability or god mode cheats that I'm aware of. However, there is a big head mode, which is a lot of fun. By completing levels for points and finishing game difficulties, you can unlock costumes and extra game modes. You can also unlock more combos in game by collecting gold spiders hidden throughout the levels. To be honest, I didn't find the combos to be worth it. The attack animation doesn't correspond well with the button pressing, and it's Mostly just better to just button mash and spam that webbing. The special unlocks you can access include Peter Parker, the wrestler outfit, the unused Alex Ross costume design, as well as a pinball mode. On Saturdays, super villain full free with proper ID. And some unused pre-rented cutscenes.
One of the coolest things about playing with the Alex Ross design is that it transforms Gobby into Alex Ross's version too. If you manage to complete the game's hero difficulty, then you unlock the ability to play as Harry Osborn as Green Goblin. Yes, Harry's in this as well. In this version of the story, you're trying to defeat another goblin that apparently was hired by Norman to kill Spider-Man in the event of his death. It is still the same game and story progression as the main Spider game, but there is enough changed dialogue to make it feel like its own side story set after the events of the main game. You ride around on the glider instead of web slinging, and Gobby has his own weapons, including the Razor Bat drones and his Bat Shuriken, whatever they're called, instead of Spidey's webbing. Anyway, here are the skins you can unlock with the cheat codes. These include a Maul Cop, a Lab Scientist, a Shocker Thug, the T-1000, Okay, it's called Captain Stacy, but last time I saw a biker cop like that in the air, things didn't turn out so well. Knuckles the Thug, the Shocker, the Prototype Goblin, and even Uncle Ben's Killer. The code for that, by the way, is Sticky Rice. There is also a code so you can play as Mary Jane. This code was allegedly removed in later releases as apparently there was a concern about lesbianism between the player Mary Jane and the in-game Mary Jane. Face it, MJ, you just hit the jackpot. Wow. So the big question we've got to ask, does this game do whatever a spider can? The answer is an all-round yes. Almost every aspect of Spider-Man's powers are on display here, or at least those that are established in the movie. Whilst there is no real apparent displays of spider strength in the game beyond can lift the thing, he does seem to pack a fair punch against most enemies. I'll give this one a pass. Spidey is pretty nimble and can jump freakishly high, and his webbing is back to being strong enough to support a heavy load and not breakable when you look at it. Finally, we're given a great representation of the spider sense. It's both functional, giving you warning to move in some specific situations, and gives you that bullet time effect used in the movie to show situational awareness. Its usage is also tied into the controller's rumble pack, adding a little proprioceptive input that almost works on a subconscious level. It's also possibly the best use of the, this function in the game. If you're a fan of the movies and these style of games, then this is one you should at least give a try. Whilst it's certainly not the best made in this period, it is one of Spidey's best. But it has been overshadowed by some brilliant games that have come before and after it. So we come to the end, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe, yodel, do interpretive dance, and all the usual gaff.